1968, there was no such thing as a programmer. Didn't exist. There were a whole bunch of domain experts. There were physicists that knew how to write uh, Fortran. Uh, there were bankers that knew how to write COBOL. There weren't any programmers. My very first job was in a bank, and I was the very first non-banker that they hired, which means that I didn't have a 20-year career in banking before they put me in the computer room. Uh, I was a, a college at I was in college at McAllister uh, College in Asian philosophy, and they hired me to write assembler code for machine programs and COBOL code for business banking programs. Uh, I had to take professional development classes in banking, not in coding. If you wanted to become a programmer, you went to, to school. You go to a trade school usually, sometimes a four-year college. And you would take a course of study like accounting or physics or any other kind of thing that you want. And you had a two-semester class in Fortran or COBOL or BASIC. Uh, and that was it. That was your training to be a software developer. And it worked. I wrote programs that took me two or three weeks that saved the bank a million dollars, quite literally, a million dollars for two or three weeks worth of my effort. Made a difference. They didn't pay me that million dollars or even a <laughs> decent percentage, but I made a difference. The problem was is that everybody wanted people to do computers, to write programs. So they had to invent a profession. 1968 was the year that software engineering came into existence and uh, became a discipline. Very rapidly became a four-year course of study. Uh, you can even get a PhD now in software engineering if you want to. Uh, lots of things to learn. Not only did you have to write uh, programs, you had to learn algorithms and data structures and of course mathematical theory uh, behind all of this stuff so you could prove that your program was right or that your algorithm was the fastest. And software just burgeoned. And so to become a software engineer meant that you knew nothing, nothing about your domain. So they said, oh, well, we'll, we'll just have the domain experts give us a list of requirements. Complete, consistent, comprehensive, throw it over the wall, and we'll build the specification. We'll, we'll write programs that satisfy the requirements. And guess what? It wasn't usable, wasn't useful. Uh, tempers flared. Everybody knew that the projects were going to fail, and it was all about pointing the finger of blame. No, business didn't tell us what they wanted. No, you didn't listen. Um, that's all it was. So this huge chasm developed. I can't draw, so I decided to do my presentation on a flip chart. Um, this, this, this is a, a big infinite gorge. And over here on this side, and these are you know, uh, 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 granite cliffs, and or maybe they're red sandstone. I come from the southwest United States, so these are big sandstone cliffs. But uh, anyway, uh, there's this huge gap that started in 1968 and got wider and wider and wider. So 52 years later, it's almost uncrossable, almost. Uh, over here on this side, we have the domain in the world. This is a world of complexity. Uh, very interesting kind of a place. Over here, we have the world of software and computing. And everything that we have learned in the past 52 years about writing software, writing code, writing programs, creating systems, has been focused on this. How to understand this. Nothing about how to understand this. Nothing. Uh, the problem with that is that the, uh, com the computer that Alan Turing invented relies on an infinite tape of ones and zeros, which means that you can write an infinite number of programs. You can write an infinite number of programs that do what you want to do, but differently. So all this idiosyncrasy. Um, there are all, th this is a, a deterministic, formalistic kind of a domain. And so things that are very natural over here are very difficult over here. Uh, parallelism. We have no trouble at all with parallelism. 
we're all living and breathing and in the same room and we're all doing our own thing and we're communicating or we're collaborating a little bit by talking together. Um, but parallelism is natural. Parallelism over here is a horrible ogre. Uh, over here we talk about things all the time. Um, you're a man, you're a woman, that's a chair. Over here we talk about functions, microservices. It has absolutely nothing to do with reality. So there have been some attempts in the past to try and create a little uh, rope rope bridge between the two areas. Object-oriented. Not object-oriented programming, but object-oriented analysis, design, whatever you want to call it. The object-oriented concept was based on crossing this chasm. Let's have a common vocabulary at minimum. So you're talking about an account as a banker, and you're talking about an account as a programmer, and we mean the same thing, and we have the same expectations based upon what it does, what its behavior is. So that was, a, that was an attempt. Agile, and I'll put Agile in brackets, because I really mean XP. Um, user stories. How many of you have, uh, have seen a user story? No, you haven't. <laughs> I, I have been doing this since uh, I wrote a, a chapter in a book with Kent Beck on user stories and agile development. I know what a user story is. I know what you're doing. You're not doing stories. Stories are about this. They're in the vocabulary of this. They talk about objects and entities and things in this. They talk about behaviors of those things over here. They talk about how these things over here work together and talk together and do things together. You don't see any of that in the stories that you're using over here in development. But it was the right idea. DDD is another approach. Uh, let's understand the domain at least and then somehow figure out how to map that uh, over here onto our computer system. Central concept in DDD, bounded concept. What's the bounded concept over here? Division or certain expertise or capability? Yeah. Or so it's a few objects together working on a common task is a bounded context over here. That's not what a bounded context over here is. A bounded context over here is how do we partition this great big monolithic block of software in a way that at least is reflective of what's going on over here. So the future of software development, the subtitle of this talk, is that over here we have software engineering They can't, can't even use space effectively. Uh, what do we have over here? What do we have that helps us understand the domain? How does it helps us understand what is going on in that domain? Well, how do you or how did you come to the knowledge of the world around you? How did you become aware of the culture that you live in and what's the right thing to do and the right place to do it? Stories. You tell stories. 95% of what you know, you learned from a story. The other 5% is that times table that you memorized or the, uh, uh, the command line interface that you memorized. But 95% of what you know as a human being was with stories. XP got it right. So you need stories over here. Do you need just a whole bunch, you know, a big pile of stories? No, you need some kind of organization, some kind of way of doing things. So um, what profession has to go out and figure out and document other cultures. 
cultural anthropologists. And what do they call it? They call it an ethnography. What is an ethnography? According to Clifford Gears, it's a thick description. You can't come up with a specification. You can't come up with formal rules. You can't come up with a formal language. But you can put together this kind of thick description of what is going on in a culture and read between the lines, make projections, make guesses, and come to understand another culture via this notion of a thick description. So stories organized and uh, curated into this kind of a thick description is a critical part. Uh, you need to have some kind of an overview. Uh, I call it a gestalt map. Very, very simple. The definition of a system, any system, doesn't matter what system it is, whether it's formal, informal, biological, mechanical, whatever. As a, a definition of a system is a set of elements and the relationships among them. So you can model any system with a bubble and an arc diagram. These don't become elements, they end up becoming objects because objects are, should have been defined by their behavior and elements are defined by their behavior. What contributions do they make either to another object or to the system as a whole? So you need that kind of an overview. And then you need a whole bunch of uh, evocative triggers. An evocative trigger is something like you're walking down the street and a waft of cinnamon hits your nose. Wow, I remember my mother's kitchen. I remember the flour all over her apron. I remember sneaking little pieces of dough. I remember what the utensils were in the kitchen. So one little itty bitty trigger brings to mind everything that I knew about making cinnamon rolls with my mother. Uh, that's what a story, a user story in XP was supposed to be. An invitation to conversation's future and an evocative trigger of conversations past. Something that's very simple. I look up at it and all of a sudden I remember the entire three hours that we agonized over putting that story together or what we were going to do with that kind of a story. <coughs> so putting all that stuff together in some kind of an organized manner and teaching people how to use it, that's what's needed. That's what the future of software development is. Uh, Nick this morning talked about the fact that you're all going to have to become domain experts in the next 15 years. This is the way to do it. Uh, it's going to be a challenge because uh, you're going to have to know a whole lot more than how to write code. How to develop a, an architecture of things over here. Uh, how many of you have read a business book? in the last year? Four. What ones? Getting to guess, for example, or uh, then just notice the difference, or? Okay. All right. How many know who John Cotter is? Ever heard of John Cotter? From the tournament. Yeah. <laughs> the foremost uh, management expert uh, in the United States, at least, uh, dealing with change and business agility and all these kinds of things. Somebody that you should know. How many of you have written a poem in the last month? How many of you know what a metaphor is? How many of you would see a customer relation management system and say, oh, that's mining and processing? And it's a metaphor, but it gives you the architecture that you can start thinking about how to put things together over here. Same thing with patterns. Um, the, the problem with software patterns is that they're all patterns of what's going on over here. You need to find out what the patterns are of things going over here. How do people organize themselves? What are the standard ways that they do kinds of things? Uh, what is tribal leadership? These are all really important patterns that exist in your domain 
and you've got to figure out all of this stuff to do it. And you've got to work in a team with multiple perspectives or else all is lost. So that's the future of development if you're up to it. So thank you.